Going back, um, anyhow, uh, so we're yeah. right yeah. downtown. <laughs> yeah, we try to get masks. 
computer. All right, Mike, what's new since this guy? Actually, I wasn't here last week. I had to take my wife to the airport. Did you try? Playing golf this week. That's pretty wet. Just starting to really get going. Well, miserable weather. Blustery. Wasn't it blustery that day? Blustery. Yeah. No, I, I have a lot of trees in my yard, so all the, whenever we get a windstorm like that, I got branches all over. Get out of my mower, and I, I have a riding mower. You pick up all the branches and chew them up. Yes, my yard is such a Sunday. It's such a mess. The other hand, my mower is heavy enough that all that rain. You know, I get like tire trains coming through the water. I had to get it cleaned up. Went to the Husky game. Where, you know, they had it on Halloween night. It's eight o'clock. Sorry, I, uh, nipped me, but it, it was fun because they killed it. Yeah. Uh, uh, their best game. Well, they're probably, if they can be Utah, they've got a good shot at the bowl game. I was kind of right off this year, but that would be a nice one for them. I don't know if they're going to drop it. They, they, everything just went right this last game. They can't happen again. Quarterback is hot as well. Scary article. Look at the temperature change in the, in the oh, no. because of the El Nino. Yeah, it's just. Mm. Well, that means more precipitation. Well, I forget which it does. More precipitation for us. Mm. The warmer the weather. The warmer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I get I get confused every time. Warmer than the snow in the mountains. Yeah, I know. Well, I got. I, they I got heard the snow over this weekend. I heard that. Uh, uh, although people that drove over Snow Palmy said there wasn't any snow there, but. Uh, Steven, yeah. Steven said it too. Yeah, they did better up there. They did good. Yeah, they did good. No. Really? <laughs> it's probably just your pocket. Yeah, but still, no, I'm surprised. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. There have been clouds on the mountains, you can't see them. I want to see some snow on those mountains. You know, I've never seen the Olympics without it. The There's Cambridge. no snow there when you look to the west. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Just a couple of introductory uh, announcements that Matt is going to present today. Um, next week, Jonathan Corrin is coming up from UCLA. So in addition to his presentation on Tuesday, there's a Monday night dinner. It's an unbranded presentation sponsored by uh, Genentech. So I, I'm going to be out of town, but I encourage you to attend. I'll send out the announcement uh, again. He's a superb speaker, even when he's giving a pharma-sponsored talk. I think there'll be a lot of educational value. Um, today's presentation, I don't have the title in front of me, but I know it's about drug hypersensitivity reactions. Okay, cool. Um, I have well over an hour's worth of stuff here. I'm going to have to, David, Talk super fast and maybe not always in English. <laughs> um, so I actually was talking to the dermatology department about this just a couple weeks ago and sort of decided to, to use that talk and sort of adapt it to us as well because I think this is interesting, certainly for all of us, the fellows and so forth, who are dealing with this on the inpatient side, but also I think relevant to some outpatient medicine. And I'll try to update kind of on the classical drug allergy stuff, but also what's really new in the last five years about mechanisms and the like. I have no disclosures and I'm not going to go into it. So I'm gonna, I got a case presentation that's a little complicated. I'm going to try to just go through it very quickly. Um, talk a little bit about how 
we teach fellows, how Drew and I think about or, you know, clinical approach to drug hypersensitivity, talk about mechanisms, both again, sort of the old, the gel and prunes, but also the new, what has really been you know, discovered uh, in, in the last few years, um, and a couple of cool examples there. Uh, I'm gonna focus then, I'll go through a few examples, but really focus on two in particular that I think are very illustrative from both a clinical and mechanistic standpoint. Talk, if I have time, a little bit about the pharmacogenetics, which is complicated, and we'll solve the case. So this is a case, again, it's a little long, but just kinda listen in and, and see if you have any thoughts. There are a lot of potential drug allergies that come up here. This is what we see every day in Arabella. Every time we get a consult in patient, it's complicated. 49-year-old guy, healthy, no medical problems um, when he develops basically angina, chest pain. Um, he's started on four new drugs when he gets the, the wards, aspirin, Plavix, Esmolol, and heparin. Uh, that's on November 10th. This is a real case, by the way, that I saw. Uh, two days later, he undergoes a cap for his unstable angina. He's got a, he has some stents put in. Um, the heparin, Esmolol are discontinued, and he started on longer acting. So now, fast forward about two and a half weeks, so November 28th, he's in a cardiology clinic and he's having muscle pain. Um, he has a mildly elevated CK, so uh, the consultant did simostat, which is stopped. He's put on pravostatin, has a lower incidence of, uh, of uh, uh, myositis. Um, and then he's also, now his blood pressure is up and it is sort of low when he's in the hospital, so he's starting on a GP. Now, four days later, he calls again. Now he's complaining of facial swelling, uh, some redness and some cough. Um, and again, he just started the lincinopril. So this is discontinued, and he's put on a different blood pressure agent, diltiazem. <coughs> Still, you know, things are going on. So three days later, he's back in cardiology clinic. We're now about, I would say, I don't know, three, four weeks, about four weeks from the start of things. He's, he's having muscle aches again. Facial swelling is still there, his cough is worsened. Um, he's now uh, not looking so great, he's got kind of a low grade fever, his heart rate's up a little bit, so his fat's down a little bit. Uh, he's noticing he's flushed, a little, a little bit of facial swelling, some blanching erythema. Uh, and he's found to have an elevated CK and troponin now. Uh, so he's admitted to the cardiac service, thinking that there's something wrong with his stents. These are his medications on admission. So again, aspirin, Plavix, Metoprolol, Pravastatin. It's stopped, still high them is stopped. He started omega-3, that's stopped, and he's put back on heparin. His labs, everything's a little wacky. His lights are a little low. His creatinine is maybe up a touch with a baseline of one. His LFTs are up a little bit. His troponin and CK are up a little bit. His white count's up, his macros down. It kind of looks like and what Mike Weiss said to speak louder. Speak louder, okay. The microphone's on, I assume. This is it. Yeah, just speak as loud as you can. All right. So um, uh, here you can see what, what he looks like on admission. I've just sort of bolded things. Again, he's a little febrile, a little tachycardic. He's got this persistent facial flushing and fullness. Uh, he's got a little bit of a systolic murmur. He's got crackly lungs. He's got some edema. Um, and he's got this persistent uh, exanthem. Uh, now it's called sort of erythema over his chest, back, and abdomen. Um, his chest x-ray shows some what's thought to be pulmonary edema. Uh, his echo shows a decreased EF. Uh, and the calf, they think maybe there's some early recent stenosis, so he has an angioplasty done. Um, and despite that, he's still not doing great. No fevers, dyspnea, and cough, so now he's have pneumonia, started on bank septaz for hospital acquired pneumonia. And here's a picture of his rash after starting those antibiotics, it seems to worsen. Uh, so now he's got this sort of again, macular or maculopapular rash over his arms, his face, his face is a little swollen. They attribute this now to the septaz, they switch him to Miro. Then during his third bank infusion, he develops respiratory failure. Which is nasalist, and now all of his labs are, of course, his creatinine's up further, his LFTs are up, his CK and troponin are going up, his white count's up, he's now got some eosinophils, and we're called, you know. So at this point, 
there and try to piece it all together. You, they tell you, oh, he's allergic to simvastatin, and like Tenafril, that has a human mycin. All right, great. Right. And all of those, they, they uh, get worse. Um, he's got hypoxemic respiratory failure, leukocytosis, elevated DK, troponin, uh, creatinine LFTs. You know, and one thing that, again, I think is always very important in looking at a case like this is to go back and build a history of what drugs, what happened when. Uh, so you should go back to the very beginning, uh, you know, four weeks ago now, um, when he first underwent a cast. So I don't know, that may stimulate some ideas. By the end of this talk, no doubt you'll have an answer for this. Um, but we'll talk about some of, you know, adverse drug reactions, such as you could see with a lot of these drugs. Uh, <clears throat> adverse drug reactions, you know, this is all old old stuff. Everybody knows this. It's, it's anything bad that happens with the drug. Most of these are non-immunologic and therefore don't interest us, and I'm not going to focus on today. But about 10 to 15 percent of all drug reactions are immunologic, and, and that's what we're going to focus on. These are things where we think of the adaptive immune system playing a key role um, <clears throat> to something that's otherwise relatively benign, and the idea of generating being sort of key hallmarks of these reactions, although that's not always the case. And generally speaking, these should not be dose dependent, so even a very small exposure to the drug will do it. We all know allergy is IgE, but in talking to the lay rest of the medical community, we probably shouldn't fixate on that, because you know, anything hypersensitivity, if you want to call it allergy, it's, it's okay by me. But I'm going to try to stick with hypersensitivity. So these are very common. Uh, estimates from this one paper, uh, I think you can see the references are, that 3 to 6 percent of all hospital admissions are adverse drug reactions, 10 to 15 percent of all hospitalized patients will develop them. And again, about you know 15 percent of these are, are going to be actual hypersensitivity reactions. Um, so whenever I approach a case such as the one I laid out at the beginning, there are a number of different things I think about. And again, this is old hat for, for many of us. So you have to think about, well, what is the nature of the reaction? Uh, so that's where we always say, you know, history and physical are key. You have to go back and really take a very comprehensive history, review, review the chart, figure out when drugs were started, when reaction, you know, when symptoms started. And then, you know, looking closely at the rash, looking at what organ systems are involved, you know, uh, and trying to detect it out. <laughs> in this, timing is critical, and I'll, I'll mention that a couple of times. Um, Again, I was first presenting a dermatology, so I really say focus on the skin, and it is true the vast majority of these involve the skin in at least a semi-specific manner. And then for me, it's always really, so is it just um, skin, or, or is there internal organ involvement? And that really changes your differential. You know, same idea, do you have a systemic inflammatory reaction going on? And then to a lesser extent, there are some critical labs that you should always think about. Cryptase, obviously, but also things like a complement. Or you know, if you're thinking about a complex hemolysis uh, uh, labs, things like that. And then skin biopsies usually are non diagnostic, but often done to rule out other entities. So the drug factors, um, you know, obviously knowing a, a, a sense of what drugs cause what reactions, although it's, it's not very specific, but knowing that beta lactams cause anaphylaxis. For hypersensitivities, uh, the back of ear causes certain reactions, things like that. Uh, and then the route, the half-life. So I had an interesting case of somebody who had renal failure and was reacting to vancomycin. That vancomycin is going to stay in the system indefinitely until they're dial dialyzed. And so you know, you'd expect uh, that the reaction will persist. Um, and cross-reactivity, which, which is something we only understand a little bit about. Host factors. So we see this all the time. Anybody who's sick other reasons, or their immune system is revved up for other reasons, tends to have more likelihood of certain reactions. So HIV is a classic example of developing a lot of cutaneous drug reactions. Um, systemic infections, so patients who are in the ICU, septic, pneumonia, and the like, always react to every antibiotic. The question is, what do you do about that? And then anybody with underlying allergies or autoimmunity, um, probably, certainly with allergies, Type one drug allergy, uh, but autoimmunity may be other other types of reactions. Ethnicity, and if we have time, we'll come back to this at the end. There's a lot published about HLA associations, um, uh, uh, SIP uh, uh, associations.
medications and other things. These are the only two that are really in clinical practice, uh, HLA-D507 with Abacavir, and we'll talk about that in HLA-D1501. In Asia, we don't screen for this in the U.S., but with carbamazepine, I've seen it done. Um, and it's unclear how many of all those other HLA associations are valid or not, uh, but these are the ones where there's, there's sufficient evidence to say it improves the clinical outcome. And then, of course, in theory, you should be sensitized to it. Um, so, again, this is the old, right? But this is still how I approach every drug allergy, is can I fit it in the gel tool? And we're all knowledgeable here, so I'm not going to walk you through this in detail, but basically you have, you know, your, your B-cell mediated, your T-cell mediated, your IgG versus IgE, uh, and trying to shoehorn it into these reactions, which, which the vast majority of drug reactions are one of these, um, is certainly so uh, again, on the on the idea of mechanism, and this this is well known to the group, uh, why drugs elicit an immune reaction. To fit it within gel pooms, obviously you have to have something that activates T cells or B cells or you know or both. And so most of those are sort of your traditional something is taken up by an antigen presenting cell, presented to naive T cells, which stimulate B cells to make an antibody response. And with macromolecules that can Protein with small molecules like penicillin, obviously it's a haptin, so it reacts with uh, host endogenous proteins. <clears throat> Prohaptin, sulfonamide is a classic example. I have some old paper, some papers um, that Steve Hill has helped publish, kind of showing how, how sulfa acts in the prohaptin. <clears throat> and then there are certain drugs that are felt to directly stimulate B cells, <clears throat> specifically neuromuscular blockers, and we see this often in the sort of perioperative or perioperative uh, anaphylaxis uh, area. So, you know, the basic idea of a haptin, the classic example is penicillin. You have this core beta lactam ring. It can react with uh, serine or threonines on endogenous proteins. The haptin protein complex is what's immunogenic. You know, again, taken up by either a B cell or some antigen presenting cell, uh, you know, broken down in some way, presented on uh, MHC and T cell response or a B cell response. So everybody knows type one hypersensitivity. So I'm not I'm not going to bother again for the sake of time. You know we know this is immediate. Happens uh, shortly after a drug. Common things are beta lactam chemotherapy, maybe radio contrast, and you get anaphylaxis. Um, and this is a, a baby with anaphylaxis stolen off of the baby shamelessly. So. I know you got a lot to do, but radio contrast surprises me. Yeah, right yeah. There. So I'll, I'll, yeah. yeah. So yeah. fair enough. So most radio contrasts are anaphylactoid, right? Nice and stuff. we recommend that. And sometimes, I mean, it is very relevant in how we manage it. Um, so you're right. It's probably not. I shouldn't have it up there as, as a common cause of true type one hypersensitivity, but it's often seen on the inpatient side of causing anaphylactoid reactions. And there are a decent. And obviously, we know that has nothing to do with shelf position, even though radiologists still ask about it. Um, uh, you know, there's no connection there. Old-time uh, allergists have never seen a positive skin test. Yeah, I've seen at least three uh, in the last three years. But you know, it, it's not the most common. So forget it. Pretend that's not on the floor. Cross it out. Uh, so we all know to draw a triptase. Of course, it never happens. We all know to treat with epinephrine. Um, and then this is where skin testing really plays a role, and we do this every <coughs> week in clinic. Um, obviously, penicillin is what uh, we have actual data for its positive and negative predictive value, but we do it with other beta lactams all the time, I think with quite good success, uh, certainly a very high, um, if it's positive, it's very helpful. Uh, and then desensitization, and since this is kind of new, I think not everybody here is totally up to date on the desensitization literature. I'll spend a minute on it, but this is what we're using. Uh, I, yeah, okay. So this is what we're using. This is shamelessly copied from the Brigham, uh, where I was a resident and I worked with Mariana Castells, and she spent the last decade really promoting this uh, procedure that she developed. Nobody knows why it works, but the fact of the matter is it works better, far better than any other desensitization protocol out there for any drug. 
And it's a 12 to 16 step protocol. Uh, rather than your classic like tenfold increase at each step, it's about a twofold increase at each step. And that's probably part of it. Uh, and also the fact that it's extremely flexible in terms of spacing drugs, you know, spacing doses, dosing out, and uh, slowing down and pausing the protocol. But the short is that she's had now well over 3,000 patients successfully desensitized. Last time I talked to her, there has only been one failure. Um, you know, and it's not always easy. Uh, uh, it's often done with, you know, a lot of antihistamine, a lot of steroid, or what have you. But the short answer is it's very successful. And, and now, you know, the quad AI up to date everywhere really promotes this as the desensitization to use. Um, she uses it a lot with chemotherapy. We've not started to do that, but also antibiotics and monoclonals. Uh, so it's definitely something to know about. We're, again, kind of making this the standard of the UW. Um, and I would say any inpatient center or even outpatient centers that are doing chemotherapy and the like we should be using this rather than sort of avoiding drugs. Because you can, the, the, the fact is you can desensitize to any um, drug for a type 1 allergy. Uh, this is basically an algorithm we're using where we try to decide do they really need a desense versus not. And, you know, if you can skin test, that's helpful. Uh, and this is just what I presented to our ID department here about, you know, basically most people who are thought to be allergic are not, in which case you can either do a skin test or do a graded challenge. But only, you know, those who are truly allergic then uh, move into this desense. And it saves time, it saves money, um, because you end up actually desensitizing fewer patients and you do it more successfully. Uh, so I can skip that. Just sort of this is the point, and this is a publication by Dr. Cassell, is kind of showing how how adaptable this is. Where um, basically on first pass it may not work, but if you use H2 blockers, aspirin, montelukast, glucocorticoids, and the like, and sometimes even rituximab, you can push patients through it, the desensitization successfully uh, if they need the drug. So again, that's what we're using. So that's type one. Uh, type two. Probably you don't think about a lot as an outpatient. We definitely see it not that infrequently, at least a couple times a year as an inpatient. But it's basically just hemolytic anemia, um, drug cause. Uh, so you have IgG here causing, you know, it's usually felt to be a drug reacting with a red blood cell or sometimes a neutrophil, leading to a novel antigen, and you get IgG mediated hemolysis. Um, NSAIDs are, are commonly implicated. Um, and basically, you just stop the drug, supportive care. But you know, it's important to think about it whenever you have a, a hemolysis. You know, look for hemolysis and then think about uh, drugs that could be implicated. Type three. So, so this is actually probably more common than uh, than most people think, and it can kind of look like a type one. Uh, so, this is really just a vasculitis. Uh, it's a, a, usually a small vessel vasculitis skin, where you have antibody-antigen complex depositing against blood vessels, um, against small blood vessels usually in the skin, uh, IgG against the drug or, or, or a haptin uh, protein complex. This used to be extremely common, probably back before any of us were practicing with you know, like horse serum and things like that. But we're actually not that far away from it. We still use effectively horse serum or ACG, so rabbit uh, serum usually. Uh, in the oncology world a fair bit, and if you ever want to see a type 3, every one of those patients will get a type 3 reaction. They pre-treat to try to minimize the severity of it with steroids and the like, but uh, it, it happens. Um, and uh, again, sort of what it looks like, I think I have a picture, well, I'll come to that. So it can be just an arthritis reaction, which again is this local vasculitis of the skin, which can appear urticarial. Complicated to sort of dissect this out from hives. Um, and what's really very important here is to look at inflammatory markers. A C4, you know, as opposed to a tryptase, is a, is a critical test. A C4 is uh, always going to be depressed in these patients. Uh, as I said, you sort of stop the drug and you treat with anti inflammatories as, as relevant. 
this can obviously lead to a much more severe reaction, serum sickness, where you'll actually get arthritis, pulmonary arthritis being one of the, the worst outcomes from it, significant kidney damage. Uh, and then if you look in the literature, there are a handful of sort of one-off case reports of using a desensitization similar to the Brigham one, but who knows if it's really useful or not, uh, but it's been done. Um, so again, it can kind of present either as palpable purpura, your typical vasculitis, or really a, a true urticaria, uh, uh, sort of like a uh, uh, complementemic uh, urticaria would. Uh, this was for the dermatology group to basically see So that fat type four um, <coughs> is your typical delayed hypersensitivity. And within this, there are a lot of different types of reactions. But on the inpatient side, this is what we're often asked to distinguish between type four and type one. And it seems like it should be a very easy thing to do. In reality, it, it can be more complicated and certainly it's very complicated for um, the non-allergen. Uh, so, you know, classically, Type 1 is immediate, type 4 is late. So, you know, 12 to 48 hours at least, maybe longer uh, if they've seen the drug before, or weeks if they, this is a new drug for them. Um, it always involves the skin, uh, and it's not urticarial, right? It's more of your sort of macula, papular rash. These are the classic examples. So, contact dermatitis, your PPD, your drug induced exanthem, and a fixed drug. Um, on the more extreme, uh, and I'll talk about this if I have time, so AG, th these are two of the three severe cutaneous drug reactions, Stephen Johnson's, AGEP, the other being DRESS, uh, sort of fit into this. Certainly AGP, AGEP is a fairly classic uh, type 4 hypersensitivity reaction uh, involving neutrophils. So this is relevant for the boards, for our fellows, you definitely uh, knowing the different subclasses of a type 4, um, uh, basically what is the effector cell. So all of these are coordinated by a T cell, a Th1, a Th2, or what have you, and recruit different effector cells to the affected organ, again, usually the skin. So for example, a type 4B, we think of with a hypersensitivity pneumonitis, uh, where um, you know nobody knows for sure, but the idea is that you have Th2 um, and then AGEP, for example, is a classic where you have uh, Th1 cells secreting IL-8 uh, <coughs> and recruiting PMN to the skin, and you get this almost sweet syndrome-like where you get these uh, diffuse pus uh, sterile pustules all throughout the skin, and that can be life-threatening. Um, so the other contact dermatitis, uh, everybody's seen it, this is your sort of poison ivy reaction. See it often with neomycin and bacitracin to the point that I don't ever give patients or recommend patients use those. Um, and this is where you can use patch testing and uh, uh, you know either topical or systemic steroids um, can be effective or are effective for that. Uh, this is though what we actually see in patients, and nobody really understands the mechanism here. But you're sort of defeat, you know, you're just delayed drug rash. And what, what do we do about that? Because this is always on patient's allergy list. And how much do we really care about it? You know, what do we do about it? And, and what it really is, it's critical to distinguish this from a type 1, an anaphylactic reaction, where obviously you don't want to give the drug again. Or if you do, you want to recognize it's type 1 and desensitize. Uh, versus also distinguish it, it from Stevens, Johnson's, or DRESS, or AGEP, where you never want to give them the drug again. If you can determine this is really just a delayed rash, no systemic issues, it doesn't really matter if you give them the drug again. It's not going to hurt them. Uh, and we often do. So classically, it's in dependent areas, so back, pelvis, which is very different from something like Dress or Stevens Johnson's, where you don't see dependency. Uh, it occurs you know, a day to weeks after. Sulfonamides are the most common, but any drug will do it. Um, and then critically, like, so people see this, they may see a little bit of skin desquamation, and they're like, oh, it's Stevens Johnson's. I mean, the fact is, if you, we stop the drug because it could be Stevens Johnson's, you don't know, but a week later, if the patient is better and di 
didn't get mucositis and the like, it wasn't Stephen Johnson. And you don't need to worry about it. And again, if you want to challenge them or desensitize them to Bactrim or something, if that was the drug, you can try it. Uh, you just need that element of time after the reaction has subsided to understand what it was. There are no, it's really just a clinical diagnosis and again, history and physical being key. You stop the drug, you kind of care for their skin. Um, this is, again, out of Steve Hillis's paper, basically how a sulfonamide, which is the most common um, drug causing this, is felt to act as a prohaptin. Basically, it's a uh, metabolite of this aryl amine group that is specific to sulfonamide antibiotics and not on any other sulfonamide and it goes through oxidation steps uh, on, and is reacted with endogenous protein. And then this metabolite, this uh, uh, oxidated metabolite, um, is what is actually felt to lead to the uh, T cell response. <clears throat> the reason it's kind of important to know that is because this comes up all the time on the inpatient side is patients allergic to sulfa, which doesn't really mean anything. Um, you know, what is that? What is that? So only these sulfonamide antibiotics, and the only one we really use with much frequency in the U.S. is sulfamethoxyl and Bactrim, have that aryl amine group, every one of them, whereas none of these other drugs, Lasix, you know, um, uh, whatever, you know, fluburide, these sorts of drugs, uh, PPIs, have a sulfur moiety, but they don't have that aryl amine group, and hence they don't cross-react. The one theoretical exception is sulfasalazine, which is broken down in the gut by bacteria and does form, as you can see, this aryl amine group, which could theoretically be absorbed and could then have the same reaction as Bactrim. But, you know, how much does it really matter? Because other than stopping the drug, you can re-challenge them, you can treat them through the reaction if they really need it, or you may be able to desensitize them. And so there are numerous Bactrim desensitizations in the literature. It's unclear what's better than the next, but we do this on a at least a couple times a month basis, uh, usually outpatient for HIV patients or, or transplant patients or what have you who have had a maculopapular rash to Bactrim but need it for PCP prophylaxis or the like. Um, we usually do a three-day protocol. This is a nine-day protocol that's in, uh, in up to date. Um, but it's definitely something worth doing. Generally, it's cited that about 80% of these work. Um, uh, But, uh, and it has been done with other drugs as well beyond Bactrim, sometimes for TB drugs and the like. Uh, <clears throat> so something to remember and to offer to your patient rather than putting them on a second line drug. Why don't you use the Brigham protocol for sulfonamides? Well, so the whole idea is that it's a different type of reaction and a different type of desensitization. And we have a Brigham-like uh, Bactrim desensitization which is fairly rare with Bactrim. And if you had a patient who was <coughs> anaphylaxing the Bactrim, that is what you would want to use. You want to use the Brigham sort of six to eight to 12 hour protocol, where the idea, the idea there, nobody really knows, is that you're somehow down-regulating IgE and, and FC epsilon receptor, whereas here we're in some way affecting T cells. And if you, I've done it, if you use a one day desensitization in Bactrim, it won't work, it never works. Uh, I've done it where a patient complained to me of, you know, it sounded like an anaphylactic reaction. Sure enough, they don't anaphylax during the desensitization, but then three days later, they have a rash. You then go back and desensitize them with this, and it works. Why? Nobody knows, but that's what the clinical data supports. You know, you know if anyone was able to isolate specific T cells again? No. So you want to repeat the question? Then? So David was asking if, if anybody's isolated, like, drug-specific T cells. Not to my knowledge, that has been done, as I'll come to in other uh, type 4 reactions, specifically with Abacavir, where they have a very clear example. But this has not attracted enough research interest, I think, to for anybody. Plus, it's hard because you know a lot of these are sort of you know <clears throat> inconsistent. Um, so, but nobody, to my knowledge, has taken a group of Bactrim allergic patients, looked at their T cells, stimulated with Bactrim, and you know, tried to see what happened. Basically, and, and the reason we have all this is because of the HIV epidemic.
epidemic and everybody needing Bactrim and so many HIV patients reacting to Bactrim that ID doctors just started empirically trying stuff and found some that worked. You make the patient come in each day? So, no. What we usually do is on day one, they come in and they get the first dose of drug, basically just to ensure that they're not going to have black, even though we're never really concerned about that. We send them home with a schedule for the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the doses usually loaded in the syringes that they can drink, so usually they quit back from. Uh, and then they just go home and they finish it and they contact us three days later and tell us it worked or it didn't. And again, you're safe doing it because as long as you know it wasn't Stevens Johnson's, you're not going to kill the patient. They're just going to get an irritating rash, you know, worst case scenario. So, and back from, I mean, I think Drew and I will both tell you, we kind of hate the drug because it, it can be tricky, uh, you know, a lot of patients do have these skin reactions, and, um, I but... Usually, yeah, I usually send them home with prednisone just in case. Just in case, <laughs> right, because, you know, they don't like it when they get the rash, but it's worth it if, if on average you can get three quarters of your patients to tolerate it who need it. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of other reactions, and, and what I was really hoping to get to, because I think that's all stuff people more or less already knew, uh, is what is kind of new in the field, and what are some cool new mechanistic uh, areas. So first I'll just say a lot of stuff doesn't fit into gel tombs. I often try to shoehorn stuff into it just for, for sort of helping me uh, have a differential and, and think about could this be a drug reaction. So for example, sweet syndrome, which is usually drug induced, is it febrile neutrophilic dermatosis. You know, I think of it as a type 4D, even though there's no evidence to support that. AIN, I think of, you know, here's you're having eosinophilic mediated renal disease. I kind of think of it the same way as a type 4B. Um, Stevens Johnson's, you can think of as a very severe type 4C, although, you know, there's a lot of other stuff going on, uh, uh, granulysin uh, and NK cells. Dress, I'm going to spend a while on here in a moment. Uh, and then a lot of things actually share multiple components, and there are a lot of kind of one off. Or, or drug-specific reactions. Like I had to do an M&M &M recently on uh, azathioprine-induced hypersensitivity syndrome, which is well reported in the literature. Nobody has any idea what it is, but it's basically a combination of a type 2, 3, and 4 reaction where you get this you know, severe maculopapular rash, you get uh, 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 immune complex-mediated disease, and you get hemolytic anemia. And so thinking of it in that framework, helps you understand what's going on and understand you know, why the drug is probably causing the patient's complicated disease. And that's, if you think back to the case I gave you in the beginning, what's going to be critical is how can you tie these all together and do some sort of drug reaction. Um, <clears throat> and then there are a lot of mechanisms beyond gel and tombs, and this is where the literature is moving. So dress, uh, there's this growing evidence that it's some sort of drug viral interaction, and I'll walk you through the key papers that have shown that. Uh, and then there are these ideas that drugs are specifically altering either the HLA or the T cell receptor. Uh, and this has been very elegantly shown with the back of your hypersensitivity, um, where the idea was either uh, something is, is um, some part of the drug is reacting with the T cell uh, or is actually binding, what they showed is binding within the MHC binding cleft uh, to alter uh, how peptide is bound and thus how it's presented to the T cell. There's also this hypothesis in the literature, which we quote often, the idea of the danger hypothesis, where you know, you're kind of having a breakdown, or, or you have second signals and a breakdown of tolerance as a result in a patient who's otherwise virally infected, you know, septic, or the like. And the classic example there would be EBV infection, getting amoxicillin and getting a drug rash, or any septic patient getting And then there's a the question of what do you do about that? Does it really matter or not? Uh, and usually the fact is it doesn't, and then you get the drug in other settings. So um, I'll come to those mechanisms just because it's relevant. Here are the severe cutaneous drug reactions we should all know about and think about whenever we're seeing a really sick patient who we think it could be drug implicated. Address, which I'll spend a while on, and, and again, is, is a, actually not that uncommon. Johnson's, ADEP, and then I'll skip over this, but uh, the, the organization that classifies these considers it one of them. There is this European research group that's 
really been trying to focus on studying these over the last decade. They're a multinational, although all in Europe, uh, collaboration where they're just trying to collect cases. They now have you know, over 1,000. Uh, and they're trying to build both clinical information but also biologic information, getting samples on these sorts of patients. And we don't have anything like that in the US. We just have a couple of centers kind of doing this one-off research. <clears throat> so let's, let's talk about DRESS. Specifically, what it is, and then the mechanism that I mentioned this idea of a viral reactivation being critical to the disease. So, address is a very curious and very um, uh, sort of, if you want to know it, it, it's not that hard to recognize, but the problem is most people don't know it. So, uh, it, it does have a lot of sort of non specific reactions. So, you, you have this cutaneous, starts usually as a morbilliform eruption and, and eventually sort of diffuse erythroderma, and it's not dependent, so it actually usually involves the face more than anything. Um, and as a part of that, you get actual dermal edema, and in the face, it manifests as seen as the angioedema. Very late, you can get mucosal involvement, like with Stevens-Johnson's, but it's not going to occur quickly as you would with Stevens-Johnson's. And then you have all these systemic features, and again, I said early on, don't just focus on the skin, but look systemically. I mean, your patient may be sick for other reasons, is it because of the drug? Uh, so classically, you get these high spiking fevers. You get diffuse lymphadenopathy, often seen on imaging, uh, is how it's usually found. Um, and then multiple organ involvement. Classically, we talk about the liver, but you can have really any organ involved. Um, I've seen pneumonitis. I've seen myocarditis. I've seen uh, GI involvement. I had a patient who died of a bowel perk from this. Um, and as you think about the case I, I laid out, you may, uh, you may see some similarities. <clears throat> so things that are very unique and are basically not pathognomonic, but have to be there for it to be dressed, is this very characteristic delay in reaction. So it doesn't happen two days after the starting a drug. It doesn't happen a week. It's really a minimum of two weeks and all the way out to like three or more months after the drug has started. And that's why it's so critical to look back over what are all the drugs that have been last, you know, several months, uh, and what could it be that's uh, initiating this? Once you, once you have an index of suspicion for dress, you need to look back at that. And then a, a very paradoxical part of it is when you stop the drug, the patient gets sicker. Uh, everything flares. Um, and we don't know why that is, but it's, it's seen the vast majority of the time. And then it's a long uh, road to recovery. Important to think about it, recognize it early. Weeks to months, uh, the drug, the disease can persist, and then it can actually flare. I have one patient who was flaring six months out. It's been reported, I think, as far as three years out. Um, so uh, it sort of becomes almost a chronic disease. And then there's a fairly high risk, as high as 20% of these patients develop subsequent autoimmune disease. Um, usually thyroiditis, but also. Can And then there was this curious finding now over a decade ago that you see very characteristically reactivation of these herpes viruses. Uh, it was first described as HHV6, but we now know that certainly any of these five, so HHV6, 7, or 8, CMV, EBV, can all be reactivated. And if you look hard enough, it's almost always there. Um, now you can see those non specifically reacted in other diseases, but it's really felt to be part of the disease, as I'll show you, uh, and it's usually very high levels by T. And does that manifest clinically as anything? Well, so that's a question I'll show you. We don't think the virus is actually causing the disease. We think it's a sort of cross-reactivity of the T cell. Um, so I use it more as a marker than anything. But uh, treating with antivirals does not help, as far as we know. So it's sort of a, a curiosity and probably involved in mechanism, but, but there's not a lot we can do about it. So just to show you some pictures, and there are lots of these, sort of starts again as this mild macula papular and eventually you get diffuse erythroderma and uh, significant edema. Uh, here it is in the face, um, sort of the progressive nature of it. And then, you know, and I first showed this to a dermatologist, so you can see a lot of different stuff. Um, uh, purpuric, some superficial desquamation. If it's going to involve the mouth, it's usually like a chelitis like this rather than actually inside the mouth. Um, that. Uh, so, 
it's historically, it was actually back in the day, it's called uh, anti-convulsant hypersensitivity syndrome. So we think of anti-convulsants being the most common cause, carbamazepine, oxygen, carbazepine. But I think that's really a historical artifact. Uh, and if you look at the most recent literature, yeah, those definitely cause it frequently. But you see it with other drugs almost So it's first felt to be have to do with this sort of uh, ring structure uh, of the anticonvulsants, and then we saw with other anticonvulsants which had distinct structures, uh, allopurinol. I mean, these are all reported as very common, common drugs. Um, but and you're not meant to be able to read this. It's just a laundry list of drugs that can cause it. I've seen it probably most frequently. So the idea is, again, sort of having a low index of suspicion for it. Um, <clears throat> there are two scoring criteria for it, which I don't use. They're really more for research purposes. I think if you have a good clinical sense of this disease and you've seen it once or twice, um, you can just sort of say, you know, you can kind of tie it together in your head. This is what that European consortium uses in their studies to retrospectively determine if it was stress or not, and they assign probability uh, to it based on the number. The issue is, for example, this, this specifically does not take into account what drug was used, what was the timing of the reaction, because they want to kind of look at the reaction itself in an unbiased manner. Um, but knowing that that's a characteristic of the reaction, I think, is important. This one is out of Japan, where, where a lot of drug research is done, and I think it's clinically more useful if you want to use one, uh, specifically because they build in the fact that there's this delay uh, after the drug was started and the reaction. They have sort of the most common features of it. And then they have HHV6, although again, I would suggest testing all five of those in a herpes zero day uh, line if you're considering stress. So there's this idea that uh, <clears throat> it, um, again, what we think is happening, you sort of start the drug. Uh, there's probably actually early on this viral reactivation that's missed. We then see it later in the course of the disease. Usually starts with skin, and then you start to have all these other internal organ uh, involvement. And actually, the eosinophilia, which is part of this name, is characteristically not, or often not there early in, in the disease. Uh, it can often happen later. So I wouldn't depend on that uh, as part of it. You'll often see more of like an EPV type picture, where you have atypical large lymphocytes uh, rather than eosinophilia. This is a more recent uh, one where they just sort of kind of pointing out the idea that you see these, these uh, viruses come up, and it's usually sequential, HHV6, EBV, and then CMV later. And so I sort of track them all in my patients uh, as we're monitoring their, their disease. <laughs> and so then this is what I kind of have been promising you. This is the you know paper that people hang their hat on in terms of how are the viruses involved and what's going on? And I will tell you up front, it is a paper that was high impact, but it's fraught with issues because it's a very hard thing to study. But I think they make some good points. They basically had 40 patients with confirmed stress, or as, as good as you can do to confirm it. They took blood and they looked at what the T cells uh, and B cells were doing. So first off, they showed that uh, both non-expanded CD8s um, and Drug, drug expanded CD8s produce a lot more interferon gamma and TNF than in a control group. So their CD8s are, are revved up. They then took B cells from these patients, transformed with EDB, since I don't think you can transform with HHV6. Uh, and then they specifically showed that if you incubate those transformed B cells in the presence of the drug, so here was a patient who had reacted to Bactrim, if you incubate in the presence of Bactrim, get uh, an increase in uh, EBV um, copy number. Uh, so showing that the drug seems to lead to, to uh, proliferation of the virus. Uh, you don't see it with any other drug, including commonly implicated drugs. So here they took gentamicin, but they also took like allopurinol, and it did not expand. In healthy controls, you see no expansion of any of the commonly implicated drugs. Here was another example of a patient who reacted to allopurinol and had specific EBV uh, uh, expansion with um, allopurinol incubation. 
So kind of promoting the idea that the drug is in some way causing this viral reactivation. And then they went to show on to show that you have EBV specific T cells, so by the TCR chain, or by the TCR beta chain, uh, they could identify the EBV specific T cells and show that they were increasing the blood, but also increasing the affected organs. So lung, skin, they had another patient um, in the kidney. Uh, so the idea that these T cells are there in the organ, probably making pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, and that the drug is leading to this, this viral reactivation. It's not necessarily that the virus is in the organ, just that the, the T cells are. Um, so, you know, whether this is a cross-reactivity of some sort, it's not entirely clear, but kind of pointed to the idea that the virus is actually critical. Um, so the, the dermatology group is very interested in this. I'll just tell you that management of this is seriously, you know, we don't know. What is typically done and what I really push is starting steroids and starting up early. Um, and the reason for that is that the mortality can be very high. Uh, it's sort of historically reported in the 10 to 20 percent range. Uh, and the morbid morbidity is even higher. Physically, all these patients are going to have long-term morbidity <coughs> due to the organ involvement um, and the subsequent autoimmune sequela. <coughs> the reason uh, we think steroids are helpful is basically because they don't seem to cause higher mortality. And if you think about it, that's actually quite critical and, and very different from what we know about Stevens-Johnson's, where starting steroids, you, you know, you think you start steroids in the sicker patients. Um, in Stevens-Johnson's, the patients who get steroids, probably the sicker, die with a higher frequency. Here, they don't, uh, with the idea that it's probably doing some good. But obviously, we have no uh, true clinical trials looking at this. But it does lower all their inflammatory markers. It all the organ inflammation. Um, uh, it does not affect the viral levels, so probably the disease is ongoing while they're on steroids. And so what I usually do is I treat them with steroids, watch the viral level until it comes down, and then you can think about tapering there. But the fact of the matter is it's usually a long course of at least eight weeks of tapering steroids. <clears throat> the dermatologists love to quote this one paper of using topical steroids, and I'll just say there is evidence that cases without any organ involvement, it may be okay to use topical steroids, but I'm very hesitant to do that. How high a dose of steroids? So you usually start them at one mg per kg, uh, and you can usually taper them down to about a half mg per kg um, reasonably quickly, and that's usually enough to control the uh, manifestation of the disease. But it's tough because these patients sort of have a flaring course where the disease can get worse. Um, so you have to why is it drug specific? The data you showed earlier where if someone had the disease from allopurinol, they didn't respond to genomycin. Does anybody know why it's drug specific in different people? Uh, no, we don't. The idea would be, uh, we don't, is the short answer. I don't think anything in that paper suggested why or what the actual mechanism of the drug is. Um, so again, that's sort of the management I just said. One, and a prolonged tapering. And that's really critical. If you taper these guys over the course of a week, you're not doing them any good, and they're going to get sick again. Um, so <clears throat> for the sake of time, I'm not really going to focus on Stephen Johnson's. I think everybody knows what it is. It's been around a lot longer than the rest. Uh, it's important to recognize it. Uh, there's not anything you can do about it uh, once it's happened, except stop the drug and put them in a burn ICU. I don't use IVIG, I don't use steroids. Patients have been shown to die with a higher frequency with both of those treatments. Um, so unless you're sort of, you know, the patients can die otherwise, uh, I would recommend against it. AGEP is curious. I think it's worth knowing this for the board, as I mentioned. It's really a very characteristic type 4D reaction. Uh, and it's been worked out in a fair bit of detail um, where IL-8 is really the critical mediator. And it's basically just this cutaneous pustular reaction harmless, uh, except that there have been a, a small percent, maybe 5%, where they actually involve the liver and other organs. Um, and so you get this sort of sterile inflammation of the liver, uh, and those patients don't do so well. <clears throat> but let's talk about these other mechanisms, which I, I think are quite fascinating. So this pharmacologic interaction with immune receptors, the idea that a small molecule can directly activate a T 
T-cell response for the altered peptide repertoire model. And let's uh, uh, just, so this graphically kind of shows what, what that is. So this is your typical haptin, where a haptin has combined with an endogenous protein, been processed, and is now being presented uh, in a, in a uh, HLA, A, B, or C, um, and presented to T-cell. In uh, the PI model, basically, you say that the drug is in some way interacting between the HLA and the TCR or on the TCR directly and influencing that immunologic synapse. Or finally, this altered peptide repertoire, the idea that the drug here in red is actually binding within the MHC, within the peptide binding group, and therefore altering the peptides that it's expressed. And this has been very elegantly shown now with the back of your. Um, this is beyond my time. This is a historical artifact now, as far as I'm concerned, even though it was just like 10 years ago. Uh, but it was a big issue in HIV and has been a really nice model. Uh, so a back of your is safe, generally safe, um, uh, uh, NRTI for HIV. Uh, it had a very favorable long-term pro uh, toxicity profile, but it was being found to cause hypersensitivity, severe hypersensitivity syndromes in a decent number of patients, and that was really one big downside. And it was actually initially thought to be DRESS syndrome, because you get this fever, rash, pneumonitis, gastrointestinal inflammation, and unless it was quickly recognized, you know, to death. And then in 2002, there was this paper that came out sort of robustly associating with HLA-B5701. Uh, and then there was this sort of big New England Journal paper in 2008 that showed if you actually screen for that HLA, you can basically reduce the incidence of this to zero. Um, <clears throat> so they took 2,000 patients, they screened for it in half and not in the other half, and then you didn't give the drug to anybody in the screened population who had the HLA. Within that screen population, they had zero reactions, and in the screens, non screen you still had you know, sort of 3% range. Um, so this was then followed up. So people thought this is a great drug allergy to study mechanistically. Um, and they again sort of approached it with, well, it's going to be one of these, either the pharmacologic interaction or the, um, uh, or the uh, uh, direct binding of the peptide groove. And that's what they showed. So there were two papers that came out simultaneously in 2012, one in Nature, one in PNAS, that showed at a molecular level exactly what's happening. And, um, <clears throat> if you want, there's a very nice movie uh, that I won't show you, it, it doesn't play on this computer, but basically here in uh, purple is a back of ear, and it binds uh, non-covalently three uh, amino acid residues within the HLA binding group of only HLA B507 and no other HLA uh, alleles, and it, it causes a steric interaction that leads to a different peptide being loaded. The peptide is pushed out further from the binding group. Um, and then, so now you get an IUT cell recognizing that as a foreign peptide and leading to this reaction. Now, obviously, that doesn't explain all the clinical manifestations of the reaction, <clears throat> but it explains, you know, what's going on at the T cell HLA level. Um, so this was the movie, again, if anybody wants really cool. They, they show you exactly uh, what's going on in terms of the binding of the back of your. And this is the Nature paper. They went on to show that basically in the context of the reaction, you do see an expansion of specific T cells, um, whereas it's not there in the, the naive setting of CD8 T cells. Uh, so for time's sake, uh, so that is the one HLA association that we actually have a clear mechanism for and we have a clear clinical implications from. And you can't read this article. These are all of the different HLAs or many of them that have been published in the literature. And I'll just focus. One of the issues with this is if you look here at a back of your, we know that it's a very high positive predictive value. Basically, if you have that allele, you're almost sure 50% you know, chance of developing a reaction. And if you don't, you're sure not to. All of these other ones have a much lower positive predictive value and, and often a lower negative predictive value. Here are two others that are actually, um, we have no mechanistic evidence, but they're felt to be highly enough implicated that at least in certain populations they do do screening. So in Taiwan, 
<coughs> they've adopted screening for HLA-D 1502 for Stevens Johnson and uh, 5801 uh, also for Stevens Johnson with allopurinol. Um, so who knows? We may and we may have more info, and that may give us a lot more insight into what are these reactions and what is Stevens Johnson, which we really still don't know the mechanism for. Uh, I'm not going to go through this, but I have a lot of issues about HLA associations in general with immune diseases because they're largely using arrays, which are, are somewhat problematic. But since I have about two minutes left, let's go back to our patients. Hopefully everybody now knows what they have, just because of what I presented. But remember where we were, we were about four months or four weeks out from the initial presentation. He had this diffuse erythematous rash, Ceftaz uh, seemed to make it worse, vancomycin, he let, got uh, intubated, he had respiratory failure. We sort of had hepatitis, carditis, um, or myocarditis, myositis, uh, mild eosinophilia, uh, mild renal involvement. And if you look back, you know, it was not that the lisinopril caused angioedema or the simvastatin was causing uh, myositis. All of those things persisted after stopping those. Nor was it that these antibiotics worsened it. It was really, you have to trace back to the very beginning. You know, if you look at the criteria, I think I have it highlighted, he really has a very high score for DRESS. And I, I told you we don't use this, or I don't use this clinically, but he had se severe eosinophilia, which is just above uh, 700. So that's two points. He had facial angioedema, um, which is characteristic. Uh, um, elevated LFTs, elevated creatinine, elevated or pneumonitis on, on CT. He had lymphadenopathy on his uh, x-ray. Uh, elevated CK troponin. He, he's got quite classic dress in retrospect that was not recognized. Um, and he, he worsened. Uh, the, the rash worsened, the angioedema worsened, and then he got basically every organ you can imagine involved. <clears throat> we actually stopped the, we, we put him on high dose steroids, we stopped all the drugs and sort of substituted what else he needed. And the question became what was causing this. I'll also say he had all of the viral titers through the roof or viral PCRs through the roof. Um, and actually, unfortunately, despite all of this, uh, he, his viruses remained high, his eosinophils remained high, he wasn't doing well. Um, and we found that, that probably, we have no proof of this, um, but it was almost certainly the stent that was put in, uh, which was a drug eluting stent, Everolimus, and kind of speaks to the fact that you don't need much drug to cause reactions. So just a little bit sitting in his coronary artery was probably what was and subsequently, this has actually then been published uh, in, a, in another patient as a case report. Um, and I think here they went in. We were trying to take out the stent in this patient, which is almost impossible to do. And I think in this patient, they were able to, and this patient uh, improved. Um, so a fascinating example, you know, again, a fascinating disease that I think everybody should know about and, and should think about in everyday life. Uh, so presented a lot of disparate ideas, but basically take home that drug hypersensitivity is common. History and physical are key with a few targeted labs, knowing to check complement, not to check tryptase. Gel and Coombs is highly useful as a framework for thinking about these, but we know a lot more now and we're learning a lot more about you know, exactly what's going on at the T cell level uh, in a couple of these diseases. Dress, again, just something to kind of take home um, for your inpatient consults. And then the idea of a back of your being a uh, pretty cool model. Uh, I think that's everything I've got, so I will stop there just a couple minutes over. Any questions? Got that all down? <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt, was that the tacrolimus, the everolimus stand, isn't that an analog of tacrolimus? Yeah, yeah. How often is that a cause of hypersensitivity reaction? As it, it's an immunosuppressor. Yeah, so it, Obviously, it's not being used as an immunosuppressive there. I'm only aware of those two reports that are coming from the rest. Uh, House and urine inhibitors have certainly been used in other type 4 reactions. Um, so, you know, you can definitely stand type 1. The cacrolimus is a pretty classic cause of anaphylaxis, actually, which is usually thought to be due to the carrier vehicle that the cacrolimus comes in. Um, but they've been implicated in a lot of I think Stephen Johnson, but I won't say that with certainty, but yeah, 
it's interesting. And, and I mean, steroids can also elicit yeah. these reactions, right? The, the non endogenous ones. Yeah. Chuck Jackson typed the question given delayed T cell mediated nature of type 4 reactions to drugs, has anyone looked at simple patch testing to reveal a T cell mechanism? Yeah, so I didn't mention that. Patch testing has been studied in pretty much everything that I presented here and is almost universally not helpful. Um, <clears throat> the one place it is helpful, obviously, is in uh, contacts, allergic contact dermatitis, where it's very useful. Um, but it's been studied in breast. Actually, that case report, they did patch test, and the woman was positive on patch test. But for dress, Stevens Johnson, uh, AGP, and others, um, it has a very low sensitivity or specificity. Actually, the one other case where it is very accurate <coughs> is in a fixed drug eruption. So if you patch test somebody with a fixed drug eruption, they will get the reaction in the same place on their skin. Uh, but otherwise, it's very useless for all of these entities, is my understanding. What, was the, what happened to this patient? Stopped. Normally, these patients. But I don't think it was still there all the time.